lot of contradictory information and a lot of controversial areas that have left a lot of unanswered questions regarding the intent of the TCPA. So we're going to cover some very complicated issues today regarding TCPA and ATDS, what is a dialer, and we'll take a look at the agenda in a couple minutes and we'll talk about the wrong number calls and some of the other areas that are out there. So joining us today, we have uh, Eric Allen with Allen Legal Services, David Kaminsky with Carlson and Messer, Tanya Klausner with Wilson, Sassini, Goodrich, and Rosati out of New York, and we also have Christine Riley with uh, Manat, Phelps, and Phillips. So I welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. We have a record attendance today. Um, we had well over 500 people sign up and I think we're well over 300 people that have joined us. So I'm going to keep you waiting too long to get into this content because I know a lot of people are waiting for the original written order which was passed in a um, vote back in June 18th and it took a while for the order to come out and now that we've got 138 pages to sit through, hopefully we can get through the majority of it in today's call. We're going to spend about an hour and a half together. We will have time for questions towards the end and as, as, as you get questions as we get through the content, if you could put those into the GoToMeeting text chat uh, tool, that way we can answer some as we go along, but the majority will try to leave towards the end. Just a little background on um, some of the things that we do here at Contact Center Compliance that we'll talk a little bit about later towards the end as well, but we've been providing contact center solutions for over 15 years. We've scrubbed over 30 billion phone numbers. We've got an exclusive litigator scrub solution to help mitigate some of the TCPA risk beyond just simple wireless scrubbing. We've got almost 83,000 litigator phone numbers and growing at two to 3,000 phone numbers per month that we can scrub on. We offer identified scrubbing for TCPA, which is very nice to have given the litigious nature of the TCPA. We've got a couple of compliance summits coming up uh, that you might want to look at if you're really going to be confused after the webinar as a way to kind of spend a full day with us. <clears throat> the next one's in Chicago on August 4th, the Hyatt Magnificent Mile, great venue. We've also got one in San Diego in October in Clearwater Beach down in December. And for people that want to do a scan of litigants on their database, uh, we'll do a free test for people that are looking to see what kind of risk they have. So with that, I'm going to shift gears um, a little bit on the agenda. Like I said, we're going to talk about everything from auto dialers to texting, calling apps, some of the consent issues, on-demand text, reassigned phone numbers. Um, we're going to look at some of the exemptions. We're going to look at some of the call blocking technology. Bulk of the time, though, is really going to be spent on a couple of these major issues that we're getting questions about. Uh, regarding what is a dialer, what can we use, what do we have, how does that work, and what do I got to do about the, the reassigned phone number issue. So both David, Christine, Eric, and Tanya all have faced a lot of these issues in litigation uh, regarding TCPA, so they really are one of the, some of the best that I've found in the industry. So we got an awesome opportunity to have everybody together today. We're going to kind of kick things off with uh, David Kaminsky going to talk to us about uh, how we got to the auto dialer definition and what, what's the meat of that that we really need to go through and understand as far as um, the TCPA. So David, if you want to kick things off, that'd be great. Did we lose David? Um, welcome everyone. Uh, oh, there you this go. is David Kaminsky. Uh, great to have you with us today. I know that uh, all of you got hit with this juggernaut that came in the form of a uh, June 18th, 2015 ruling released on July 10th. But uh, we're going to try to wade through this and try to give you some clarity so you can understand um, what this whole law is about, what the FCC has really ruled, and where do you go from here. So again, this particular law came out on uh, July 10th, 2015. This is a declaratory ruling by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. They released this 138-page uh, uh, ruling in response to roughly 21 or more petitions uh, regarding uh, TCPA issues. And there were so many issues that were brought up. We've got what is an auto dialer? What is capacity of an auto dialer? And 
what's the extent of the definition of an auto dialer. Also, uh, they dealt with liability of calls to reassign numbers, revocation of consent, and it, and it goes on from there. So this is what the FCC said in a broad way. The FCC reaffirmed its position, but look, we're going to construe this TCPA broadly. That's how it should be. We deem this statute to be a remedial statute to protect and for the benefit of consumers, so it will be uh, construed broadly. We want to, quote, empower consumers as if they didn't have enough power. They said we want to empower them further so they can stop unwanted calls because that's some of the biggest complaints that the FCC was getting. Uh, the re re FCC reaffirmed again. He said, look, this the TCPA was enacted for two purposes. We want to protect privacy and public safety uh, because they actually believe that companies are still calling, quote, emergency lines and tying up lines and, quote, causing a threat to public safety. Uh, the TCPA also, the FCC reaffirmed its restrictions to wireless numbers and they're going to say, look, this is not just a telemarketing statute. It applies to informational calls, calls that, let's say, do not contain any kind of marketing or any kind of unsolicited um, information. So they, they reiterated that this applies to everyone. Debt collection calls still within the purview of the TCPA. There is no exemption. And what the FCC said about this new rule is interesting. They said, we're not making any new rules here. We're just clarifying existing law, resolving some controversies regarding the interpretation of certain issues in existing law. Well, in our opinion, we don't believe that's entirely accurate, as you will see as we go along, because there's going to be things that you have heard now probably for the first time regarding uh, certain rules that were made by the FCC. Next. So let's give context. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the TCPA. TCPA, again, the statute, what we call the 227B1A part of the statute, basically says, look, it's unlawful for any person within the United States to make a call using an automatic telephone dialing system. That's the ATDS, an automatic telephone dialing system, or an artificial or pre-recorded voice to any number assigned to a paging service, cell service, or any service for which the call party is charged for the call. Again, quickly, it's a call to a cell phone via an automatic telephone dialing system or a pre-recorded message without consent. Hey, Landline call. On your slide, sorry to, sorry to jump in. Just I think it didn't come out on the um, on the slide. The actual without the consent of the called party. Just so you're aware. Ah, thank you so much. Um, we yeah, asked somehow that got missing, and we apologize. That will clarify the uh, this slide in the final version. Uh, landline calls. There is basically on the informational call side, no liability for artificial pre-recorded informational voice calls made to landlines because of the FCC said we've given a broad exemption. It's the commercial call exemption. You can see that at the bottom of the screen. And that's a good thing. So that's with respect to landlines, because they've always said, look, there's generally no liability for using an auto dialer to call a landline. It's the trigger for liability is the pre-recorded and artificial message calls uh, to a cell phone without prior express consent. But the exemption, the commercial call is so broad if it does not uh, contain an unsolicited advertisement. Next. So what is the dialer rules say, what is an automatic telephone dialing system? This is one of the uh, biggest issues that has faced the FCC in dealing with their uh, new ruling. So uh, automatic telephone dialing system, an ATDS, is defined as follows. It means equipment that has the capacity to store or produce numbers to be called using a random or sequential number generator. Again, it's equipment. And they look at that word equipment, which has the capacity another trigger word, to store or produce telephone numbers to be called using a random and sequential number. So they have the word produce using a random or sequential number generator and to dial such numbers. As we go further, you're going to see that that uh, definition in part gets e eviscerated uh, through the FCC's interpretation of what is a dialer. Next. So this is what the FCC has ruled 
on auto dialers as to what is an auto dialer and what does capacity mean. They said, look, we're just going to reaffirm our 2003 and 2008 FCC rulings that have been out since for 13 or 12 years now. And we're ruling that, look, all predictive dialers are auto dialers. We believe that predictive dialers have the capacity to dial thousands of numbers short period of time and could harm public safety. They harp on this ridiculous harm public safety issue. They don't like any equipment which has the ability to dial thousands of numbers in a short period of time. That's one of the sticks of the FCC. Dialer is also equipment which has the capacity to dial without human intervention. Again, this comes from their FCC 2003 and 2008 rulings. They said, guys, we're not really telling you anything new. We're just reaffirming and clarifying. So again, it's the capacity to dial numbers without human intervention. Of course, as you've seen and has been discussed before, well, gosh, capacity to dial numbers without human intervention, that includes everything. But this is the key. How the human intervention element applies to a particular piece of equipment involves a case-by-case -case determination. This is directly from the FCC. They said, we're not going to tell you and we're not going to define human intervention. It's going to be left open and whether or not you have it, human intervention and you so that you do not have an automatic telephone dialing system is going to have to be determined on a case-by-case -case determination. That, of course, throws things in flux and in the air. Very problematic. Um, a dialer also includes when you're calling from a set of list of numbers. So you can take a set of list of numbers, upload it to your equipment, and then dial that potentially without human intervention. You have a dialer in their opinion. Even if you're, you have equipment that can do all this and you're saying, but I don't use it, they don't care. They're saying you're not using it, you still have a dialer. Speed dialing, yes, they've reaffirmed again. Speed dialing does not um, invoke uh, the TCPA. So if you have a desk phone, a handset desk phone on your desk phone and you are using, quote, a speed dial function, no potential liability is what the FCC says. Next. Capacity. This is also one of the big issues under the TCPA. They said, we're going to clarify this capacity once and for all because you, industry, have asked us, the FCC, you want us to deem that capacity means, quote, present capacity, what, quote, the system or the equipment can do at the moment that you're doing it. Sorry, they said, we're not going to interpret it in that manner. This is how we clarify capacity. The capacity of an auto dialer isn't limited to its current configuration, but it's going to include potential capacity, potential functionalities. So if your dialer, they said, with a, a bit of a software upgrade, a change, a tweak here and there, a reconfiguration, a, a system modification, they said that is potentially, quote, that means that you could have a dialer even if you don't have one quote right now, but you can add some software, you can add uh, random and sequential number generation is one of the examples that they actually gave. The, well, because you can add that probably to most dialing equipment, you have a dialer. Uh, the FCC said, we're going to interpret this word capacity broadly. Uh, that's what we're going to do. But they said, look, it does have outer limits. It doesn't mean that Everything in the world is a dialer, and we're not going to allow, quote, theoretical potential capacity to be considered in the auto dialer definition. And they gave some examples. They said not every device is going to be a dialer, like those, your iPhones, your iPads, etc. They said, look, handset with a speed dialer is not a dialer. They didn't define what a handset is, but we believe that they may be referring to your standard um, desk telephone that sits on your desk. There's a, they actually use this example. A rotary phone is not a dialer. And we all said rotary phone. I haven't heard that term in about 23 years, maybe even longer than that. And what's interesting is here we are in 2015, yet we're going back 30 years with respect to technology uh, because of the interpretation of um, all of these rules. Again, so we said that that according to the FCC, the broad interpretation of capacity is not going to sweep in things such as a smartphone. 
uh, the FCC. We're going to look at the smartphone issue. We're going to look at the capacity issue. We have a wait and see approach. And if we believe there's an issue, guess what? We'll give a further clarification down the road if we need one. Next. Interesting and very short, I just want to mention here, throughout this opinion, the FCC has inconsistent definitions of what a dialer is under this ruling. First they say, hey, it's the capacity to store or produce using that random or sequential number generator. Well, that's the TCPA statutory definition. That's a good thing. We like that definition because it, it gives us at least somewhat of a level playing field when you're having to battle the dialer issue. Next they say, well, it's also capacity to dial without human intervention. If you have equipment that can do that and dial thousands of numbers, in their opinion, you've got to dial your third. Dialing equipment that has the capacity to store or produce and dial random and sequential or se dial random or sequential numbers. They took out the word generate there. They said dial. So, well, gosh, most equipment can dial random and sequential numbers if I uploaded a list of numbers even to my a desk phone here, they can dial the numbers randomly. They can probably dial sequentially depending how I put them in. So that, that's a overbroad and I think careless explanation or definition. Next. Another issue that has come up with the, um, with the issue of a dialer. Some people have said, look, if I'm using separate equipment, one equipment at one location potentially stores my numbers and yet I have a, a calling function and the dialing function at a separate location. At that point I've split up and no longer do I have a dialer. FCC said, okay, that's a clever and a, a creative way at an attempt to try to avoid potential TCPA dialer liability. They said, if you're splitting up the system of basically, look, when you combine the two together you really have a dialer in our mind, something that ultimately can dial without human intervention, then they believe that there is a dialer. Of course, that will have to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Next. So um, I think that now it, uh, we turn it over to our next speaker. Hi, uh, this is Tonya Klausner with Wilson Sonsini. Um and I'm a partner in our New York office here, even though our firm is based in Silicon Valley. I work with a lot of our uh, East Coast clients. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about actually a, a very small silver lining for at least some companies within the ruling. One of the, one of the good things that is found within what is otherwise a pretty horrendous um, ruling for most American businesses. So um, the the Part of the order starting at um, paragraph 25 addresses petitions filed by several app providers seeking rulings that they aren't liable when people use them to send auto reply texts or to send text message invitations. Um, there were a lot of comments that had been filed with the FCC by other app providers as well as text messaging and calling platform providers that merely providing software, the technology that facilitates calling or hosting a calling service is not in and of itself a TCPA violation. Um, and the FCC largely agreed with this. Um, so, so the legal issue that's implicated here is who is initiating a call or text when you have an app or a, a texting or calling platform that is being used in a, in a sort of a self-service basis. Um, and what the FCC concluded is that whether apps and platform providers can be deemed the initiator, so the, the person or entity that is liable under the TCPA for a violation, um, will depend upon the totality of facts and circumstances surrounding the call. Um, so the, they adopted sort of a two-part test. Who physically took the steps necessary to place the call or to send the text message? And then did the app or platform provider become so involved in that process that they should also be deemed to be the initiator, considering the goals and purposes of the TCPA? Um, well, the first part of that is pretty straightforward, who, you know, sort of the but-for causation, who, who physically caused the call or text to be sent. Um, the second part is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the FCC did lay out some factors to be considered. Um, Ryan, can you go to the next slide? 
So here are some factors, and, and for any of you who ever were involved in a TCPA suit involving text message, I'm sorry, involving faxed advertising, these may look familiar to you. So um, the FCC had previously issued a ruling back when people were using faxing to uh, market and advertise um, that fax broadcasters were not liable if they unless they had a significant degree of involvement in the sending of the faxes. So the FCC essentially adopts those same types of factors. Um, who decided whether to send the text messages um, or, or make the calls? Who selected the cell phone numbers to which the calls or texts would be made? Who supplied the content of the messages? Um, and, and essentially what they're looking at is they're looking at these apps and self-service platforms um, as Really, they're saying that you know these we consider these essentially are likely to be auto dialers, and who's programming them? If the user is programming them, then the provider of the app or the platform will not be held liable. Um, so it's looking to the level of involvement, and which which really makes a lot of sense. Um, now, if we can go to the next slide, they, the FCC did, of course, say a few other things that are a little bit more pro problematic. So even though your app or your platform is just providing the technology that's being used to make the call or send the text message, um, the FCC said, well, there are a few other things that we, that we deem important in deciding whether that app or, or platform provider should be held essentially jointly responsible. Did you enable spoofing? Did you uh, enable call blocking? Um, those are just sort of functionalities that really are just technology in and of themselves that perhaps could be used for, for good purposes or bad purposes, but um, you know, if you're doing those types of things or if you knowing allow your users to use the platforms or apps for an unlawful purpose, then that might be enough to get you over the line from being sort of a passive intermediary to being responsible um, for the, the, any violation itself. So overall, I mean, this part of the ruling um, is actually pretty beneficial for technology companies and app developers. Lots and lots of apps um, allow it. I have no idea whether anybody on the call is um, provides apps, but um, you know, now everybody has an app. Even retail companies are having apps. And if you enable any type of texting by your users to invite a friend, recommend a friend, um, things like that. Uh, there, it does seem like, based on the principles that are set forth in this ruling, there is a way to set up those marketing types of growth programs um, in a way that the, the provider will not become liable for any TCPA violation. And I think that was it on, for me on this issue. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, consent issues, I believe. And um, David, I think this is your section as well. Great. Um, just to give some context uh, with regard to um, consent and everything, of course, consent must come from the called party. It has basically been held under the TCPA that it is the called party who has standing to bring this suit. So this this issue of who is the called party has been an issue that the FCC has also grappled with because called party is not defined in the TCPA, although that phrase is used. So FCC ruled, look, called term called party, clearly ambiguous. And so many um, persons who filed petitions have asked the FCC this, since it is so easy to quote by accident call a wrong number or to call the wrong party or because telephone numbers have quote been reassigned even when we had consent to call it let's say in January of 2015 by the time June 15 rolls around that number for which we had consent to call and we can document has been then quote reassigned to another party. So please FCC deem that the called party is the intended recipient, i.e., the person whom we as the company were intending to reach, 
not the person that actually got the call. They shouldn't be deemed, quote, the called party. And the FCC said, no, we are going to, quote, reject the intended recipient theory, and we're going to say this, that this is who is the called party for the purposes of the TCPA. It is the subscriber. It is that consumer that is assigned the telephone number that was dialed and then billed for the call. But they said, we've got to look a little broader than that because now we have family plans. There are business plans that have been maybe one general subscriber and then multiple, multiple phones and lines. They said, so that person, the customary user of the telephone that is included, let's say, in a family, a business plan, et cetera, that person is going to be deemed a called party. And the subscriber, the non-subscriber, the customary user, some courts have already called that the regular user of the telephone. Those are the type of persons they can grant express consent to be called. Not someone else, not Joe Smith. It's the person who you were intending to call, the person who is the subscriber, the person who is that customer user. If that's who um, is the holder of that particular cell phone, then they have the right then to give consent, to grant consent, to deny consent. Next. So the FCC looked again at the consent rules. And the FCC said, look, this is, we're, we're going to look at the consent issue and, and, and focus on how do we get consent? How does a company secure and obtain consent from a consumer? The FCC said, we're not going to specify the method. The TCPA didn't specify a method. It was left up in the air. So we're going to say that the FCC doesn't require any particular method by which a caller has to obtain prior express consent. And that's a good thing. That leaves it open. That means that we're saying that you can get it in so many different ways. You can get it orally. You can get it in writing. Um, but the um, FCC said, look, just be careful because you want to make sure that you are getting consent from the person who has authority to grant consent. And, um, and then also what they've mentioned is, look, uh, if you're getting consent, you better make sure that you can document it and have a business model to do so, so that you can capture that consent and then you could demonstrate that you actually have consent and you can prove it if you ever had to in the context of litigation or otherwise. FCC said, we're also going to look at our older rules here. We're going to go back to 1991 and 1992. And since 1991, we've been saying, if someone releases their telephone number voluntarily in the context of a normal business communication, we're going to be saying that they've given their invitation. They're giving their permission to be called at that number, which they've given absent instructions to the contrary. Again, that's absent instructions to the contrary. And it's very rare in a business context, at least from what I've seen, um, that someone, let's say, would be signing up for a credit card and providing their number on a credit card application and saying, but don't call me on it. Uh, but that's, that's how this rule sort of emanated from the ex express consent. The FCC always wanted it to be brought, and that's a good thing because that helps businesses at least get consent, and then the question is, quote, getting it and then capturing it, documenting it. Uh, a number in a contact list, if you have a big contact list and you don't know from whence those numbers come, uh, again, those numbers, you may not have consent to have them because you're not going to know if you do or if you don't. Consent has to be expressed. It has to come from the consumer. And the best thing is to get it from the consumer's mouth not from the aunt, not from the spouse, because you don't know if any of those persons could have authority to um, give consent for on behalf of another to call that number. And uh, they reiterated this again. Uh, the burden is going to be on the caller, whoever makes the call to the number at issue. If you're using auto-dialed equipment to call a cell phone, you need to know that you have prior express consent to call it, because if you don't, you could subject yourself to potential litigation. And the burden on proving that, again, is going to be on uh, business, not on the called party. They've actually said this uh, in quite detail in their 2008 FCC order, and they're just reaffirming it once again 
that uh, putting tremendous uh, constraints, of course, and burdens of proof on businesses. They don't want to burden, quote, the poor consumers, as they say. And the FCC said this is very important, interpreting this whole issue of consent. And what is the scope of your consent? You should be looking at that issue very narrowly. FCC said in this case called Nigro, where they filed an amicus brief um, in a appeal matter before the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. They said, look, you need to, we're going to look at consent, and consent as we have defined it needs to be construed narrowly. Look for the purpose for which the purpose, the person consented, and see if you have the right and ability to call that person for the purposes for which you're calling. If someone said, yes, call me on the telephone to, um, um, to make sure that I don't, um, that there's, that I'm not, that I wasn't a victim of fraud or a data security breach. If someone then, then takes that number and then calls them for a telemarketing purposes, they probably don't have consent in addition to the fact they would need to have that consent in writing, but they, that, that wouldn't be consent then to call for marketing purposes when they only give you uh, the opportunity to call for um, um, non-marketing purposes and uh, fraud issues. Next. So going back to even the FCC's 2000 declaratory rule and prior express consent how do you get it what is it well it can be verbal it can be writing right someone tells you on the phone you have consent to call me please call me on my cell phone that is consent clear and unequivocal so again it can be verbally and writing if it's verbal you need to find a way to capture it so you can protect yourselves in order to um, defend against any potential litigation uh, the TCPA, again, was silent on how you can capture consent. That's a good thing. You can capture it via a website, uh, placing a number on a loan app, a credit card application, conditions of admissions form in the medical context, patient intakes form. Um, the FCC has said that is also uh, expressed consent. So consent, of course, it can be directly given to the party at issue. But as I said before, only get it from the horse's mouth. And that 2015 ruling, again, emphasizes this very issue. Next, let's talk about revocation of consent. This has been a big issue uh, with the FCC. Various petitions address the issue of revocation. And the question was, how can consumers revoke? Some of the petitions actually said that consumers should not be allowed to revoke consent once consent has been granted. So. But this is the, the crux, and this is the rule that they came out with. Guess what? A caller cannot limit the manner in which revocation may occur. Revocation, a called party, a consumer, someone that is a holder of a cell phone, they can revoke via any reasonable means. And reasonable means is not defined. So again, via any reasonable means. We don't know exactly what that means, but it's going to be interpreted, quote, in a fairly broad manner. The FCC, is, all these rules have to be interpreted. And again, they're saying that a company can't limit the manner in which revocation occurs. So let's say, for example, in a credit card application, the FCC is saying that uh, since revocation can be made via any reasonable means and a caller can't limit that, does that mean that a credit card company can't contract with its consumer and have terms and conditions that say if you seek to revoke consent to call you at your cell phone number, you can only do so by a writing, a writing to our office received by our office and acknowledged by us, or words to that effect? That question remains in the air because it's interesting. There is a, um, a decision that came down in 2014 called Osorio. Uh, it's from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals governs um, those states in um, Alabama, Florida, Georgia. And that case said this. We've looked at the, can, the revocation rules, and we believe that a consumer can revoke in writing. You can revoke orally because the TCPA was silent to it. So the FCC has made a consistent position, but they said this, they can revoke orally, they can revoke in writing, absent instructions to the contrary. Again, that's absent instructions to the contrary, absent 
contractual terms to the contrary. So this is going to be a very interesting issue, how this FCC rule says, hey, you can't limit the way someone can revoke consent. That can potentially conflict with 11th Circuit um, uh, binding authority uh, in certain jurisdictions. So this is going to be remain to see how this issue plays out as we move forward. But this is also to say that, look, the fight isn't over. We have ways to fight some of these rules. Um, the FCC has said, look, the reason why we're making um, this whole revocation issue so broad is because we don't want to put the uh, burden on the called party to show revocation. It's not fair to them. Okay, They shouldn't have to bear the burden. And uh, they have the right to revoke, period. Let's also discuss for a minute the porting of a number, because this is an issue that has caused some confusion, and the FCC has clarified it. Um, Porting, just to be clear here, porting is not taking a uh, a landline number and then forwarding it to a cell phone. That's called call forwarding. And the FCC has ruled several times that call forwarding, forwarding your landline number to a cell phone is not, quote, that doesn't invoke potential TCPA liability because you're really calling a landline number. Someone just happened to um, uh, forward it to their cell phone. But call forwarding is taking a landline number or other number and then um, changing it from a wireline to a wireless device so that no, it is no longer a wireline device. So if you take your wireline device and let's say you had express consent to call that in the first place because someone put their landline number on a credit card application and then they take that number and then they port it uh, to a wireless service so now that same number is now a cell phone you have consent to call it because you had consent when they signed up on the credit card application and they gave you their number voluntarily uh, with consent. Also, if um, someone takes one wireless number and, and you had consent to call that number and then they uh, port that number to another wireless type of device, it's rare but it can happen, you have consent. But if you call a landline, right, without prior express consent and you may have the commercial call exemption so that when you leave that pre-recorded message on that landline, you don't have potential liability. So you're thinking, I'm good to know, go, but that person has then ported that number to a cell phone. Well, you never had prior express consent to call the landline. You just had the benefit of the commercial call exemption to leave pre-recorded messages. But now it's a cell phone. You didn't have consent to call now a cell phone what you need to have if you're using, quote, an ATDS, an automated telephone dialing system, to call it. So you have to get that type of consent. And you're saying, well, gosh, how am I going to know? It's from your cell phone identification uh, uh, programs that many of you are using, and some of the best ones out there clearly have the um, ability to have the entire wireless block of numbers issued within the United States and, of course, the ported number list almost on a real-time basis. So there's ways to figure out if you're calling a landline that is that what was once a landline now ported to a cell. Next. Uh, very briefly, revocation. Look, it's, it's the same for informational calls, those that do not contain a solicited advertisement, and telemarketing calls. No distinction. Someone wants to revoke, they can. Unfortunately, the caller has, to, has the burden to prove consent. And they're saying, you've got to prove consent, company, and you've got to prove that someone didn't consent. Why? Because you have the ability to do so. Of course, how you prove a negative is, is going to be very difficult. But that's why so many of us on the phone, I know Christine would say it, Tonya would say it, Eric would say it. We all believe here, record, record, record. Recording is your window to the world. It captures everything on a phone that someone is going to tell you. And so when they say that they revoked their telephone on January 5th and you documented a call on January 25th and you have that recording, you have your window to the world of proof. If not, and if you're not recording, you don't have a proper business record because although you may have documented the fact that they did or did not revoke on January 5th, it's going to be a he said, she said fight if you don't have the definitive proof that recording to do so. So I'm a huge advocate of recording. Um, callers should also maintain, as the FCC has said, they want you to maintain those proper business records to track consent, to track revocation, right? 
They said, look, business record, that's your window to the world, companies, and you know how to do it. And since we're putting on you, companies, the burden of proving consent or the burden of proving someone didn't revoke, then um, you, uh, you need to have, you need to document and have the proce proper business records. Again, as I said at the bottom, proving oral consent, record, record, record. Next. Um, also, interesting issue, I've been able to eviscerate countless TCPA class actions because my client actually had the recording, the documentation, the proof of what was said in the given recording, so we were able to, quote, nip a, multi, a potential multi-million dollar case in the bud, and that's exactly what you want. Okay, now we're going to move to um, reassign telephone numbers, and with that, we're going to turn it over to Christine. Christine, take it away. Thank you, David. This is Christine Riley from Manad, Phelps, and Phillips. I'm a litigation partner in our Los Angeles office. I do a significant amount of counseling work in this area, and I'm also co-chair of our firm's TCPA compliance in class action defense practice. We're going to dive right into reassigned wireless telephone numbers. And Ryan, if you can go one slide back, please. So this has got to be one of the most disappointing and impractical rulings. Uh, it, is, it is very troubling. So I hope you all are sitting down for the next part of this discussion. As David mentioned earlier, they rejected any argument that the definition of called party under the TCPA would be the intended recipient of a call, meaning if you've gotten prior express consent from a phone number and you believed in good faith that you were calling that same person and you didn't know that the phone number had been recycled or reassigned, we were hoping the FCC would say that was good enough. You thought you were getting the right person, it was the intended party, you didn't know that the phone number had changed and that would be good enough. Unfortunately, the FCC has said, no, that is not the case. They are defining called party as the current subscriber, and that means the person who is actually assigned the phone number and billed for that phone number, or the non-subscriber customary user of the telephone. And that could be, for example, someone who is on a family plan or a business calling plan. Here is the new rule that they believe is going to help companies in terms of reassignment and liability under the TCPA. They are giving what is called a one free pass rule. And what that essentially means is you will get one liability free call to call a number that has been reassigned after the phone number has been recycled or reassigned. One free call. Now, in order to even qualify for this one free pass, you have to show it's your burden as the caller to show that you had no knowledge of a reassignment of that phone number and that you had a reasonable basis to believe that you had valid consent to call that phone number in the first place. The whole purpose behind this one free pass rule is the FCC is saying they, they're going to give you this pass in order for you to gain actual or constructive knowledge of the reassignment of that phone number. And what actual knowledge means, and this is examples from the FCC, for example, actual knowledge would be if a call party told you that they are the new subscriber or that you just have the wrong phone number. Another example of actual knowledge would be you've accessed some kind of paid database that reports on the probability of reassignment. Or you've re received information from the wireless carrier that the phone number is no longer in service or it's been reassigned. An example of constructive knowledge would be hearing a tone indicating that the number is no longer in service or even hearing a different name on a voicemail than the party that you intended to call. I suppose one good thing here is that the FCC is going to give you 
unlimited period of time to make that one free call. You get one, you get it at any time when you decide to make the call after reassignment. And here's where it really just gets very troubling. The one call does not need to connect to a person, an answering machine, or a voicemail. Meaning, even if that one call is just a mere attempt to call that phone number, you are deemed now to have knowledge, constructive or otherwise, that the phone number has been reassigned. And to make this extra clear, this is what the FCC has said. This one additional call, if this one additional call does not yield actual knowledge of reassignment, we deem the caller to have constructive knowledge of such. So it doesn't matter if you call the phone number and you do not glean information that has been reassigned. The FCC is saying that you are deemed to have known it was reassigned, period. Christine, Christine so what does that mean by somehow divinity or, or I'm, quote, deigned to know from some kind of telepathy that <laughs> when I call this, I mean, is, is that what they're basically saying here? That's just because I called it and it's been reassigned that that means, quote, I know it? And, well, you know, the FCC has given various ways in which you're supposed to have some kind of knowledge that the phone number has been reassigned. And, you know, quite frankly, they are pretty impractical, but we are going to go through those as what the FCC thinks you need to do in order to comply with such a heinous rule. And you might, you know, it all sounds very crazy, and it's because it is pretty crazy. And if you're wondering, why is the FCC doing this? How, how are they coming up with such a crazy rule? Well, it seems that in the record, the FCC has been motivated by, you know, what they call a barrage of telemarketing voice calls and debt collection calls. And in particular, they keep talking about this unique concern for debt collection calls and calls that are being made to public safety lines. And that seems to be sort of what motivated the FCC to come up with a rule that sounds as, as impractical as it is. But I have to tell you, it's going to get a little worse before it gets better. So next slide. So you've got the one half rule. Christine, can you clarify with a couple questions whether this applies only to wireless numbers, or is this also for landline calls? Well, the order talks specifically about wireless telephone numbers, because that was the context in which the petitions raised these particular issues. I think you're going to see most of these reassignment issues are going to come up in the wireless context, given how frequent and often those types of numbers are recycled. So you're going to see most of these issues on the wireless side. So we have the one pass rule, the one free pass rule, but here's where it gets even a bit more sticky. They're giving you a single caller rule. They're saying a single caller gets one free pass. What is a single caller? A single call caller, according to the FCC, is any company affiliate, including subsidiaries. Any company affiliates, including subsidiaries. So the FCC here seems to be assuming that companies have the ability to make some kind of simultaneous exchange of information across multiple platforms and companies, and you're expected to know when one of your company affiliates or your subsidiaries have called a phone number. So in other words, two affiliated entities may not make one call each. You all, between all of you, you get one call total. Really, you know, question how that's going to be practical, practical for companies to comply with. And I think we're going to see a lot of litigation on what exactly, exactly is a company affiliate. Um, and who qualifies as a single caller. It seems um, this rule is going to be pretty wrought with litigation on interpreting exactly what that means. You might also be wondering, well, what about if it's wrong or misdialed phone numbers? Not a reassignment, but let's just say you punched in the phone number wrong or the information that was even given to you by the consumer is just a digit off. Well, the FCC does us no favors here. The FCC says, the one free pass doesn't even apply to wrong or misdialed phone numbers. 
Why? Because they're saying you didn't have consent to call that phone number in the first place. The whole gist of the rule is that the FCC is saying you, as the caller, are responsible for making sure that you call the right phone number. And they are doing what they consider to be a rule that, quote, gives every incentive to call the right subscriber for the right phone number. A really great point was raised by several of the petitioners. What about having some kind of bad faith defense? Let's say you have a, a called party who has a recycled phone number, and they just sit there and they wait to be called. They don't tell you that they have the wrong phone number. They just continue to sit there and get, for example, text messages and accrue statutory penalties. The FCC rejected any such defense. They're saying it's your obligation as the calling party to get it right, and the called party has no affirmative obligation to call to tell you that you have the wrong phone number or to opt out in any way. It's extremely disappointing, not even a bad faith defense. So I know all of you are sitting there and wondering, how are we going to comply with this? How is this even practical? Well, the FCC thinks that if there's an existence of a database or tool combined with some best practices and this one free pass rule, they believe that together this makes compliance feasible for companies. So let's talk a bit about how the FCC thinks you can comply with this. Next slide. I'm going to warn you, a lot of this stuff is going to sound insane, but this is what the FTC says you can do to comply with this rule. You can make manually dialed calls to confirm the identity of the call and call party. Extremely burdensome, especially if you only get one call. Or they say, why don't you listen to the name on the voicemail? Assuming you get a voicemail, and if it's different from the person you think you're calling, that should give you constructive knowledge that it's been reassigned. Also an extremely burdensome, burdensome rule. Another idea that they had was, well, why don't you send emails or mail requests to confirm that telephone numbers are correct and that you have updated information? I'm sure we, we can implement such rules, but of course that's not going to allow you to necessarily come within a one-call Free path. I think where we're going to see a lot of compliance on this particular issue, what database tools there may be that can give some kind of idea on whether a phone number has been reassigned. And they specifically mention a few tools in the FCC's order. We talk about New Star's verification for TCPA products, and I suspect there'll be some other products that come on the market that will also try to use information to predict if a phone number has been reassigned. But of course, I have to tell you, there is nothing out there right now that's going to give you 100% accuracy on whether a phone number has been reassigned. And the FCC knows that. They, they recognize that it's not perfect. But they believe that there are tools out there that you can use to get a better sense of whether or not a phone number has been reassigned. They also seem to be encouraging carriers to come up with some kind of option that will be more effective in determining if a phone number has been reassigned. So perhaps we may see some solutions from the carriers themselves who may be able to give some kind of service or package that can allow you to know if a phone number has been reassigned. We're just going to have to see how the carriers respond to that. Another idea they had was well, why don't you just have consumers notify you when they switch their phone numbers? And you can write this into a contract with your consumers, and if that consumer doesn't tell you that they've changed phone numbers, well, you can seek recourse against that consumer and perhaps a breach of contract and sue your consumers because they didn't tell you they switched their phone number. Wait a second, Christine. I Hold on here. Are you telling me that the FCC is saying, Hey, have terms and conditions that requires a um, 
a consumer to notify you immediately at any time their contact or their telephone numbers changed or they're no longer using and then they're telling you hey you have legal remedies so go ahead and then sue them if they breach that agreement are you telling me the FCC is like encouraging um, companies to sue their customers their consumers that is indeed one of the suggestions from the FCC that you can seek recourse against your own consumers. I mean, wow. I mean, most companies are not going to sue their consumers. And you know, sure, you can write in these terms in your terms of use. You can write them into contracts. But you know, the question is, what good does that really do? Are you going to sue your consumers because they didn't tell you they switched their phone number? You know, are you going to be able to recover anything monetarily from your consumers? I mean, certainly if your company is sued in a class action, you're not going to be able to sue consumers and have them pay your legal fees to defend the class action. It is, you know, it's one of these suggestions that really entirely misses the mark. And I'm really not sure why the FCC is encouraging businesses to even suggest suing their consumers. It's and really it, it won't it won't exciting. prevent the violation anyway, right? So you're still right. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't prevent, prevent the, violation. the violation under their interpretation. It's you know it's one of these pie in the sky type of ideas that's completely impractical. And even if you have a legal remedy, what good is it going to do? Um, well, Christine, I, I I would think that if the um, lead plaintiff in a class action is one of the persons who quote did not. Uh, did not um, uh, did not uh, inform the company and breach the agreement to notify the company that uh, you know that their number has changed. Um, that that could be it could be a different issue. So um, we'll, we'll see how this uh, we'll see how this all pans out. And another suggestion they made is well, why don't you include some kind of interactive opt-out mechanism in your pre-recorded call? so that your recipients of those calls can easily report a reassigned or long phone number. In other words, in your IVR systems, you can have a selection that says, you know, if this number has been reassigned or it's the wrong phone number, press 1. Um, sure, I mean, I, I suppose companies can implement something like that. But again, the question is, is it doable? Um, and is it going to come within that one call rule? Next slide. There's a whole bunch of different suggestions from the FCC on different policies and procedures that companies can implement in order to come into compliance. So some ideas they have would be, you know, coming up some kind of procedure for dealing with wrong number or reassigned phone numbers. Either, you know, reports from customer service reps who are placing outbound calls. Another idea is, you know, allowing your customer service reps to record new phone numbers when they receive calls from customers, or policies for determining whether a number has been reassigned if, for example, there's been no response to communication with that consumer after a period of time in trying to contact them. I, I do think that in the end, companies are going to have to come up with some policies and procedures to deal with this new rule. And it means it's going to mean companies have to be very vigilant in making sure they make changes to records that their customer service reps are trained on making sure they input information correctly and make changes. And it's going to have to be across platforms. But it's going to be you know, difficult for a lot of companies to do this across multiple platforms in ways that they communicate with consumers. Another way, and maybe this is a little more practical, having some kind of auto dialer or manual dialer to recognize triple tones that can kind of tell you if a phone number has been disconnected. So perhaps there are some automated solutions that will allow you in some kind of automated way to figure out if a phone number has been reassigned. Um, and hopefully there will be some solutions on the market that will allow us to do that. And that might be more practical of the ones we've been discussing. And lastly, this is Here's another one where you say, what, what are they talking about? What are they thinking about? They said, well, why don't you enable customers to update their contact information by responding to any text message they receive? I'm really not quite sure what that means and how that's technologically possible. 
But I suppose the idea is, you know, allow consumers to respond to a text message and let you know that the phone number has been reassigned. I'm really not sure how that works out in any practical sense, given character limitations on text messages. But that is one of the other ideas that they have. You know, I think in the end, when we look at compliance on this issue, we're going to be looking primarily at the policies and procedures to deal specifically with this issue. We're going to be looking at database tools and programs out there that may be able to help predict if a phone number has been reassigned. We're also probably going to be looking at the carriers to come up with some solutions to the extent that they don't already offer one. And we're probably looking at some kind of automated solutions that will help you identify if a phone number has been disconnected through triple tones or otherwise. I think in the end, you know, it's pretty clear here, here with this new rule that the only winners here are really consumers, serial class action plaintiffs, and the plaintiffs bar. Uh, there's going to be, you know, continue to be a lot of litigation in this area, and this rule is no doubt going to be challenged. It's going to be appealed. Um, and there is going to be significant challenges to whether or not this is authority that the FCC has to make this kind of rule. And this is, you know, of course, I'm going to go back to what David said earlier. This is supposed to clarify what existing law is. With coming up with a single caller rule, a one free pass rule, it's sounding a lot like rulemaking. And I think there's going to be some challenges as to whether or not the FCC is truly clarifying law here or if they're creating new law, and whether they have the authority to do so. Hey, Christine, what are the damages before the, the new TCPA ruling for wrong party calls, and are they the same now? The damages are all the same. So, you know, there are statutory damages under the TCPA, and they are $500 minimum per call, and up to $1,500 per call or text message if the violation is found to be willful or intentional. So you're looking at you know, exposure on reassigned phone numbers to be a minimum of $500 per text message or per call. The damages are still the same, which makes this extremely troubling in terms of compliance and TCPA liability. I know I've said a mouthful, so I'm going to go hand it back over to the next speaker. Before we jump into the next section, one of the things we didn't talk about was the difference between TCPA and do not call when it comes to business to consumer versus business to business and other calls and texts that aren't normally covered by do not call. This might be a good time to kind of reiterate the almost non-exempt areas that TCPA does cover that surprises a lot of people. Eric, do you want to cover that? Um, so B2B, uh, B2B often thinks that they're exempt from all telemarketing law when really they're only exempt from some of the rules. The FCC has jurisdiction over all calls on some level, whether a call is made uh, to a business line or a consumer line. The cell phone rules in particular and the restrictions on the delivery of uh, auto dial calls and pre-recorded messages to cell phones is not consumer specific. The rule is agnostic regarding uh, the type of line, business versus consumer. So that's an example of one significant TCPA restriction that applies equally. It protects business cell phones in the same way that it protects consumer cell phones. You are not allowed to send a pre-recorded message or even to call a, a business cell phone just using um, you know, most software platforms, uh, any, any, any platform that would be considered an ATDS or auto dialer. So yes, B2B is affected. The TCPA does govern many B2B calls. Okay, I think this is uh, this is back to me. Um, before I move to the next topic, though, I did want to make one comment on um, Christine's last topic, the reassigned numbers. 
everyone's probably sitting there going, really? Did the FCC really say that you have to do something that they admit you can't do? Um, yes, they did say that. And that coupled with the very broad definition of ATDS that they've provided means that essentially, I would argue, under this new ruling, any consumer using an iPhone who dials a wrong number has now violated the TCPA. It is absolutely insane. The one thing that's good about the fact that they, they, it's so absurd is that it does give a good basis for lots of appellate arguments. Um, and there are a lot of parties planning to file appeals. They've already been appeals that have been filed. Um, and I think that we're going to see from a, from a lawyer, geeky lawyer perspective, some very interesting constitutional issues because you can't have a law, it violates due process to have a law that people don't know if, they can, if they're complying or not. Um, and this also implicates a lot of First Amendment issues. So anyway, that's the, the, the um, reassigned number issue is really a very wild and out there issue, and it's going to be continued to be litigated um, very vigorously by lots of parties who participated in these proceedings. Um, and I suspect it's somewhere, something that also is likely to be uh, brought where there will be lobbying efforts made to try and get Congress to step in here and say, no, you know, consent, prior express consent means prior express consent to the person who gave you the consent and gave you the number. That's what it should mean. Um, Moving on to the next topic, um, so there were, uh, I'm sure everybody on the call is familiar with the changes that the FCC made back in October of 2013 um, to distinguish between informational and telemarketing calls for purposes of the type of consent that you need. You need to get prior express consent, which as David explained, could be oral, can be any providing a telephone number if you are making informational calls um, to, if you're making informational calls, but if it's a telemarketing call, it has to be prior express written consent. Um, so a lot of the, the mobile marketing industry filed petitions saying, well, if we already opted in our list, so we have our list, we got prior express written consent previously, um, do we have to, you know, we, we didn't read this ruling as saying we have to go back and re-opt in all those people. I mean, that would be crazy, right? I mean, these are millions of people in the United States who have opted in to uh, engage in text messaging programs like rewards programs, coupons programs. We shouldn't have to go back and send them yet another message saying, opt in again um, because there's now this new regulation. And they sought relief from that. Um, well, what the FCC said is, um, yeah, actually, you do have to go back and you do have to re-opt in anyone who's given you, um, given you consent before. Doing a double opt-in, for those of you on the call who, who are doing mobile marketing, doing a double opt-in prior to the, the new regulation is not going to be enough. And the reason that it's not enough is because the way that the FCC defined prior express written consent in the regulation is, is that it includes certain disclosures. The regulation itself, I would argue, is not clear as to whether you actually need those written disclosures in the consent itself, but what the FCC has said now is, yes, you have to, when you get the consent itself, the agreement that the consumer signs, which can be checking a box or any other means that would satisfy e-sign, but that agreement itself needs to include the disclosures that we included in our definition of prior express written consent. Um, now, this is pretty terrible news for the mobile marketing industry, um, but there is uh, sort of, a, a, I would say that the FCC threw a bone to the industry to try and make this a little bit more palatable. If we go to the next slide. Um, and to, what they did is they said, okay, well, we, we recognize that there was ambiguity. It wasn't clear in our ruling, much like every single FCC ruling that they have ever issued. Things aren't clear. Um, they didn't make it clear that, that uh, consent obtained prior to October 16, 2013 would not be effective going forward for ongoing campaigns. So what they did is they have granted a retroactive waiver 
uh, to the prior express written consent regulations going back to when the, the new regulation went into effect in 2013, and it's a 90-day forward-looking waiver. So basically, companies that are engaged in mobile marketing ha and are members of the organizations that file these petitions um, can now go back and get the consent for the people who for whom they were relying on consent that had been provided prior to that date. Um, the, what the FCC say, you, you have this, we're going to give you this limited time frame, but now you need to go back and you need to do it right. Um, you need to include those disclosures in your agreement and um, including it on a call to action because what a lot of companies were doing, a lot of resale companies were doing is you go into the store and you see a poster and it says sign up for our rewards program and they were including on that poster or sign the, the disclosures that the FCC says you have to include, that the calls would be made using an automatic telephone dialing system or an artificial or pre-recorded voice and that um, agreement is not a condition of purchase. So those are the disclosures. Those are being included on the signage and the FCC is now saying that's not enough. You actually need to have that language in your written agreement itself. So if your written agreement is the double opt-in, you need to include it there. Um, next slide. Okay, um, Eric Allen here with Allen Legal and telemarketinglawyer.com where we advise and defend sellers, call centers, and dialer vendors. I'm going to cover these two exemptions quickly because we're uh, very limited on time, but if anyone has questions, just shoot me an email um, and I will give you some deeper analysis. Eric at allenlawyer.com. So put your happy face on. This is some good news, at least for financial and health care organizations. The FCC already had power to essentially pick uh, from so-called free-to-end user calls that they felt are, that were important and exempt those from the TCPA's consumer consent requirements. Then they took advantage of that power when responding to two particular petitions, that from the American Bankers Association, the ABA, and then this one's a mouthful from the uh, petition by the American Association of Healthcare Administrative Management. So regarding uh, certain financial calls, the FCC agreed that some of these are so time sensitive and important that they need to be exempt and no consent will be required. In particular, fraud and identity theft alerts, data breach alerts, messages to victims of a data breach about things they can do, um, so remedial measures essentially, and finally, key instructions for pending money transfers. So a financial institution gets to send these types of messages to a cell phone. This could be a text, a live call, or a pre-recorded message. Uh, so long as, Ryan, uh, next slide for the conditions. So long as uh, the financial institution follows these uh, conditions, these limitations. They can only be sent to the wireless number provided by the customer. You must disclose the name and contact information of the institution. So a business name and phone number would be enough, I think. Also, the message may not contain any marketing or debt collection uh, content, nothing other than the essential uh, financial alert. And this is especially important because the FCC reiterated this after it listed the conditions. It reiterated that uh, marketers need to be especially careful not to sneak any marketing or collection or account management type content into these uh, calls. Also, the messages must be quote-unquote concise and generally be one minute or less for calls and 160 characters for text. Uh, they clarified that it could be a little longer if that was absolutely necessary to respond to like a follow-up consumer question or reply. Also, the financial alert can uh, not be sent, well, they can't send more than three messages rather per event, like per uh, fraud alert or data breach, et cetera, over any three-day period for an affected account. Also, 
You have to provide an easy means of opting out. There are some rules about that. We won't go into that. Uh, email us about that. <laughs> They're similar to the opt-out that's required for the call abandon message or other robocalls, though, IVR, key press, et cetera. Also, you have to honor the opt-out immediately. Note this is different from um, an internal do not call request or opt-out where you have up to 30 days to make that request effective. Uh, the financial institution will need to honor that immediately. Uh, next slide, Ryan, please. Okay, healthcare messages. So, uh, the AAHAM petition requested that the FCC clarify that certain free to end user calls, again, this is where the call party is not charged by the call, uh, uh, certain of these messages from a healthcare provider should be exempt, should not require any consent. Uh, these include the following, appointment and exam confirmations and reminders, uh, messages about wellness checkups, hospital pre-registration instructions, you know, hey, remember not to uh, uh, eat or drink for four hours before you check in, something along those lines, I, I think, uh, pre-operative instructions, lab results, hey, you don't have cancer, uh, post-discharge follow-up intended to prevent readmission. Uh, you know, remember to take your meds or et cetera. Uh, prescription notifications and home health care instructions. Unlike with the uh, petition by the ABA, they didn't buy all of the different categories. For example, I didn't list them here, but they, do, they did not grant any exemption for calls about insurance or billing, uh, payment options, uh, Social Security disability eligibility, and a few other categories that the AAHIM had wanted an exemption for, but this is good for uh, healthcare institutions who want to send these important alerts without, uh, you know, getting written consent. Uh, Ryan, next slide, please. Uh, some of the conditions are the same, but some a little different. Uh, again, this is only for uh, messages sent to the wireless phones, uh, the, the wireless numbers provided by the patient. Also, they have to state the name and contact information of the business. Cannot include any marketing, collection, accounting, billing information. Also, the message must comply with the already existing HIPAA privacy rules. The message must be concise. Now, this is a little different than the uh, exemption for banks. The messages must be concise and generally one minute or less for calls, 160 characters for texts, but note this. They get to send one message per day and up to three messages in any one week from a specific provider. So a little different uh, from banks. Also uh, have to have that opt-out and the opt-out must be honored immediately. So if you are a financial or healthcare organization, do your analysis on these exemptions. It may allow you to contact your uh, customers and patients, on the, including on their cell phones, uh, through uh, texting, pre-recorded messages, and these certain limited categories. This is uh, one thing I think we can smile about. Uh, back to you, Ryan, or whoever's next. Thanks, Eric. We're going to try to uh, shift this into a little bit of high gear, cover the last few topics. Hopefully, we'll have some time for questions. I know there's been a lot of them that are uh, pretty detailed. Hopefully, we'll be able to through the last section and spend a little bit of time uh, with the questions that we can answer on today's call. I think the next thing we're going to get into is the on-demand text messages, which, Christine, those are your initials. Yes, that would be me. So we have some more good news following up on Eric's discussion on exemptions. Really good job done by the Retail Industry Leaders Association who inquired about on-demand text messages, meaning, you know, a text message that is sent in response to a consumer-initiated text message. An example, example would be, let's say a consumer sees an advertisement in print, or maybe a call to action display in a store or online, and they text in to that short code that's on the advertisement or call to action and they're looking to get a, a discount coupon. So they, say they respond to the short code with the phrase discount. And in response, a company sends back a reply text with a coupon. And the FCC has said 
these types of one-time text messages that are sent immediately after a consumer request does not violate the TCPA. And we said the reason it doesn't violate is because they're not going to consider these types of text messages to be telemarketing, but rather more informational, a fulfillment of the consumer's request. So here are the conditions you need to know in order to qualify for this type of um, path under the TCPA. First of all, you need to have a request that's initiated by the consumer. So the consumer is reaching out to you through some kind of a user-initiated text message, and you're responding to that message. The second is it needs to be a single text message that you send and respond, one message and response. And the FCC says that if it's more than one text message, you're going to need prior express written consent if it's marketing. And that's what I mean by PEWC. In terms of timing, this response text needs to be sent immediately to that specific consumer request. And here, this is going to be very important, if you're going to be initiating these types of reply messages, the FCC says that your reply message must only contain the information that's requested by the consumer with no other marketing material in that reply message. So yeah, I see this as a, a positive good thing that has come out of the FCC's ruling. And I suspect this will give at least some um, optimism and something positive for those of you who are engaging in these types of user-initiated text messaging programs. Next slide. I realize we're running pretty short on time, so I'm going to make this section pretty quick. The FCC has said before, and they've said again, listen, text messages, they are called under the TCPA. Commissioner O'Reilly disagrees, seems to imply that perhaps that should have never been the case. But it seems pretty clear that that is pretty well established as far as the FCC is concerned. If you're engaging in some kind of equipment that's sending intranet to phone text messaging, that's going to be considered an auto dialer under the TCPA. And if you're not familiar with this type of technology, it's basically a message that's sent from a computer to a wireless phone. And it usually has, as, as part of its email, the combination of that person's telephone number and their wireless carrier's domain name. And they're kind of automatically converted by that wireless provider from an email into text message when it's delivered over the network. Or another way they do it is through a web portal. But it's still, at the end of the day, these messages are coming as emails to begin with, and then they're converted into text messaging. And given the volume, that, that is capable of sending these types of messages, this type of internet to phone text messaging capability is going to be considered an auto dialer. Now let's just get right to it because there's some language in there that sounds a little concerning and let's just address it. There's some language in the FCC order that says they're clarifying that other types of text messages that may pose consumer harm are also subject to the TCPA. And they talk specifically about text messages sent from text messaging apps that enable entities to send text messages to all or substantially all text-capable U.S. telephone numbers, including those that have some use of an auto-dialer application that's downloaded or otherwise installed on their mobile phone. The idea being that consumers still have some kind of privacy impact, that consumers may incur some type of data cost for such text messages. And from the FCC's perspective, they think that not including these other types of text messages will leave a glaring gap in the statute's coverage. So what does that mean exactly? Well, there is some citation here in the FCC order to what's called interconnected text messaging services. And of course, the FCC cites to a specific CFR regulation that appears to be the wrong site, but they're trying to get to interconnected text messaging services. So what are those? 
those are ones in which you're using some kind of third-party app, but in the end, you're still sending text messages. So here's another way to think about it. You know, a lot of us think, well, does that mean it's covering, you know, third-party apps like WhatsApp or things like that? And I think the answer is no. Like, you know, WhatsApp is, for example, a service that allows you to communicate. And it looks like you're sending text messages, but it's not actual text messaging. Your WhatsApp is a service, for example, that it's using the phone number as, it, as an identification means, but they're not actually using the cellular network to send SMS text messages. So what would be an example of an interconnected text messaging service? That would be probably something like Google Voice. Uh, that service allows you to send and receive text messages from any number from third-party apps, web pages, or anything of that nature. So if you have an iPhone, you can actually send a text message from Google Voice to anywhere from your Google Voice phone number. And I believe that is what the FTC is specifically talking about, not these sort of third-party apps that aren't actually doing SMS text messages, such as WhatsApp. So in the end, I think we're still talking about cellular network-based text messages. We're using a cellular network. I know a lot of you out there are, are asking, well, what about push notifications? Are they included in this broad interpretation? And I'm not really seeing this as encompassing push notifications. The word push notification does not appear anywhere in the FTC's order. And it does not appear that that is what they're intending to address at all. It's not discussed, and I don't know that that would be a fair reading of this particular element of the order that's talking about interconnected text messaging services that are using some kind of SMS text message. So summary, internet and phone text messages are auto dialers, and text messages are called under the TCPA. And I'll hand it back over to the last topic for Eric to talk to you about. Okay, real fast, guys. The, the 60 second background on this rule is that in 2013, representatives of the telecom industry in a congressional uh, committee hearing stated that they didn't think they were allowed to offer call blocking features because of this prohibition from the FCC's Wireline Competition Bureau, which basically said, carriers, you're not allowed to just selectively block or choke or interfere with calls unilaterally in the attempt to reduce your own um, access fees, for example. You can't do that. Uh, so the National Association of Attorneys General noticed, and they wrote a letter, not a petition, but a letter to the FCC asking the FCC to clarify this issue. And the FCC did, in fact, clarify that no, while that old rule stands, if a consumer elects some sort of call blocking technology, the carrier is allowed to provide that and block um, actual or suspected robocalls from certain numbers or categories of numbers uh, that are suspicious. Uh, and a footnote uh, says that this encompasses both residential, uh, you know, individual consumer lines as well as business customers of service providers. So this is another part of the order that affects B2B. There was that prior question. The FCC encourages carriers now to provide blocking services, but cautions that carriers should be careful not to block robocalls from public safety organizations like law enforcement. Also, the carriers must disclose when they offer this technology the risk that certain wanted calls might be inadvertently blocked. As long as they do that, they can offer this technology. I'm curious to see whether this will actually explode uh, and become popular or um, if, if we'll be stuck with the, you know three or four uh, kind of products we have out there already. Again, this does apply B2B, just like the expanded definition of an ATDS would affect B2B, just like the reassigned number would affect B2B when calling cell phones. This will be, this will be available. This clarifies that even business um, uh, subscribers can uh, ask their carrier to provide blocking service. Although the carrier is not required to provide that, they're just allowed to. Back to you, Ryan. So this actually is a good segue into the next section, which will hopefully we can cover a few questions, but I had a quick uh, comment on this. 
the actual carrier that I use here in the uh, Bay Area, they have been using a robocall blocking technology for about a year now called Nomo Robo. And they just actually sent me an email yesterday clarifying that they thought that they had the ability to do so. The company's called Sonic.net um, based on the, their interpretation. They were applauding the FCC's decision and commented that they had blocked up to 5 million robocalls uh, since they put that into place. So, um, yeah, and in fact, Ryan, no more robo call control and telemarketing guard were the three kind of vendors or, or solutions that the that NAG had specifically referenced in their letter, although the FCC said we're not making a ruling regarding any particular blocking vendor. We're just in general saying there is no barrier in our rules to carriers uh, cooperating with or offering this blocking functionality. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see what the carriers come up with. It's kind of a, um, contradictory, though, in the sense that uh, a lot of them obviously make money on uh, call centers and five-volume marketers, so blocking their own traffic seems uh, it's kind of ironic. Um, uh, hopefully, um, some of you folks have some time. Maybe we can go through at least a couple of these questions that I think are, are relevant. We may even follow up on email. Another opportunity would maybe to do another webinar just on the questions we received alone. Um, we had well over 400 people attend, and there's probably a good hour's worth of questions on here at least. So hopefully we can pick up some more some more uh, relevant ones. Um, this is also a good segue why it makes sense to come out to one of our compliance summits coming up. Again, we've got one in Chicago, August 4th, San Diego, October 22nd, end of the year in Clearwater. And then also with the amount of increase in litigation, um, I can't see any reason why anybody wouldn't want to scrub on our litigator database. Um, so we can talk to us about that. And also, just in terms of having a good uh, legal counsel, having multiple people look at your dialing practices, your communication strategies, taking a look at um, working with Eric, Christine, or um, Tanya, or David. I highly recommend all four of them in terms of uh, being experts in their field. So. Um, I'm going to kind of pick out a couple of questions that hopefully we'll have. Uh, I know a couple of attorneys here that have some other stuff going on, and uh, we can kind of go from there. Um, the first one is, do debt collection calls continue to rely on the 2008 FCC interpretation, which states if the customer provided a cell phone at the time the debt is generated, it is interpreted as prior express consent? Um, yes, could you repeat that one more time? So it's, uh, it's specific to collections calls. Do debt collection calls continue to rely on the 2008 FCC interpretation, which states that if the consumer customer provided a cell phone at the time the debt is generated, it is interpreted as prior express consent? Yes, that is true. That is, that is what the FCC um, ruling said, and they said that uh, if a uh, if a uh, a cell phone number is voluntary, voluntarily provided to the uh, a creditor at issue, then a debt collector stepping into the shoes of the creditor for collection purposes also has that what they call pass-through prior express consent. Uh, and of course, if a, a consumer gives you express consent at any time and they give it to you, you know, directly, you have consent as well. So no change on that? No, there is no change from the new FCC rules. They did not vitiate any of the rulings that they made in their um, FCC 2008 ruling. Thank you, David. And what about the question that I've heard a lot, not only on the webinar, but from a lot of our clients and people we work with, which is, a lot of the communication platforms have come up with a manual call strategy that's a separate system to call on aside from the dialer in order to not manually call cell phones but basically emulate a manual call but still have the efficiencies and the productivities and the uh, analytics behind a communication platform. 
are those systems now going to be subject to the definition of an ATDS? Well, that, that, that is a good but broad question, and I don't know exactly what um, system the, uh, the uh, person is referring to, but there are so many companies out there today, uh, so many dialer companies that do offer what they call uh, a dialing system that they believe is a manual-only process. But I think you need to look at those carefully, of course, vet those and vet those with your counsel um, to make sure that um, you, you and your counsel are considering what, what is right for you and what the system actually does to make sure that you're uh, doing what you can to protect yourself. And I would, I would just add to that, this is Tonya, um, that I think that the order does, it's a little bit of wiggle room because they do, um, in at least part of the order, uh, reiterate the dialing without human intervention issue and say that that will be approached on a case-by-case -case basis. So I would expect that this is an issue that unfortunately is going to be continued to be litigated in the courts. And this is Christine. I want to add to that. That you know, I think actually the FCC may have thrown us a bone on this because, quite frankly, I'm not sure that we would have gotten something positive from the from the Democratic commissioners on the human intervention part. I know Commissioner O'Reilly really kind of says you haven't really given much guidance on human intervention and does reference those comments in the record that talk about preview dialing, click to dial, single touch, and so on. So, you know, it's probably a good thing that they did not address that as there's some room to really argue that those types of dialing systems may not be covered. But as David said, we're really going to have to look at those on a case-by-case -case basis and you're going to need to talk to your legal counsel about your dialing system to figure out where you may fall. Yeah, and the plaintiff's absolutely. lawyers will say anything is, right? The plaintiff's lawyers are going to say, based on this ruling, unless you're using a rotary phone, you're using an ATDS. So and that's exactly true, Tonya. That's what they're going to argue. Because what they said is, what, what the plaintiff's counsels know that they can do, they can, with almost every dialing platform or system, at least attempt to create an issue of fact so mm -hmm. they can take an issue that they can fight from the beginning of a lawsuit to the end of the lawsuit. And they know that at times that it's difficult for uh, a company because sometimes you can start a litigation, class action, go through class certification, and then at the end of class certification, you're dealing with the merits of the case and whether, quote, the dialing system constitutes a dialer under the TCPA. It, it, it puts some, the company at times in an impractical position. That's why you have to vet these issues thoroughly, quickly, and up front. What about the cases involving uh, VoIP phone numbers? The order doesn't really talk much about that. I know we started a service for identifying VoIP numbers out of a, um, a lot of RFPs and requests we were seeing on our end. But does the TCPA rule apply to VoIP numbers? Are they considered landlines, cell phones? Um, what about true ones that are transferred over? You know, you got a lot of Google people using Google Voice, Skype numbers, things like that. Do you have any experience in uh, litigation with white numbers and is that just going to kind of go away now that they've got such a wide open door with uh, um, ATDS being uh, expanded and wrong number calling, et cetera? Ryan, this is David Kaminsky on the VoIP issue. I've litigated that issue several times. Um, there is a decision out of the Fourth Circuit Co Court of Appeals and um, in that decision, uh, that court held with respect to a VoIP telephone service, Voice Over Internet Protocol, where plaintiffs said, I have a Voice Over Internet Protocol service, and I'm being charged for every call. The court, after analyzing it thoroughly, chose to uh, place the liability within the wireless side of the TCPA instead of the, quote, wireline or residential phone section of the TCPA saying that this device that this person has, this VoIP phone is, quote, any other device for which the called party is charged for the call. And therefore, um, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeal ruled that it does fall, uh, quote, under the wireless bucket. I think that can be challenged. I've challenged that issue numerous occasions. I'm not within the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. and um, so 
Um, therefore, um, there is still, quote, a, a big fight on this issue. It is not completely resolved. I always argue that that you're calling, quote, as the TCPA said, you've got to, and the FCC told all industry back in, reiterated in 2003 in that FCC ruling, the, the um, FCC said, hey, look, we're going to tell the world it's not just the telemarketing groups that have to, quote, scrub for uh, cell phones, but it's also the um, every other industry as well. You've got to scrub. There is, quote, scrubbing technology out there to know what numbers you're calling. Well, as the commission has admitted on different times and as different companies have admitted and experts I've spoken to just recently, there is no foolproof method to determine if you are calling a VoIP phone. The cell phone identica identification technology mostly can identify um, the landlines versus cell phones, but nothing definitive to find that something is definitively a VoIP phone. So the argument is also there is no technology out there, quote, to analyze this issue, but if you, you do, you're coming up with a landline, and the VoIP call issue should always be relegated to a landline call because it is not a number that falls within the wireless block, and I think that is a key issue. And I've won some um, uh, um, cases based on that, based in part on that argument. And I, I just as do very short, the Google, the Google Voice issue, uh, Google Voice is merely a a, a transmittal of, quote, usually a, um, a landline call to um, a, um, you know, different type of devices, your computer, your iPad, your cell phone. And so it looks like someone's getting hit with a cell phone call. Um, I had a case where I had to convince Planet that this was a, quote, landline call that was made. There was never a cell phone call. They showed me that there was a cell phone call that hit their cell phone, but it's because they used Google Voice and it was forwarded to their cell phone. So the analogy that I made with the court was this is similar to, quote, call forwarding and doesn't give rise to a TCPA cause of action for use of a, um, use of a dialer to uh, call a wireless device. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, there's a lot of um, gaps in the VoIP coverage. So even if you scrub for VoIP numbers, it's only as good as what's reported up to the carriers. There's not a nationalized database. So there, if you don't scrub for VoIP, VoIP, the problem is those numbers can show up as landlines, and you can end up in a situation where you know you got to defend a case, which can get expensive. So. Um, and by the way, the case that I was referring to, and I apologize, uh, was, um, this is David Kaminsky, it's called Lynn, L-Y-N-N, versus Monarch. That's out of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, but no other circuit, federal circuit court, has followed that decision thus far, and I'm not aware of any other decisions following the Lynn line of reasoning thus far. One court suggested that they were, but did not make a ruling. Let's take a couple questions, and I think we got to wrap it up just because we're getting into a couple hours here, and maybe we can do some follow-up, or like I said, maybe do another webinar on questions. Which is um, the two the two questions. The first one is, um, which is I think kind of ironic given the the timing of the FCC's rules, which is the effect on political dialing and political marketing, which I believe still falls in the FCC. And the other is really about some of the other types of dialing that. Um, just to clarify, that they do or do not fall under the TCPA, which would be preview dialing, and a couple of people have asked about the avatar technology. So I'll throw both of those out there. Maybe we can wrap things up. I'll address uh, very briefly the, the avatar issue, um, and then I don't have to jump off the call if I have another meeting. But you know, the avatar technology is technology that uses some kind of um, ability for a live agent to be choosing which kinds of sort of these pre-recorded segments um, to send out to consumers. And there was a, a similar technology that I call assistance where they sent a request to the Federal Trade Commission asking whether or not the Federal Trade Commission would consider similar technology to be a pre-recorded voice for purposes of the telemarketing sales rule, not the TCPA. And there's a, a nice letter from the Federal Trade Commission saying that they did not consider 
call assistance technology to be a pre-recorded voice. I understand there was also call assistance had done something similar to the FCC, but it was actually voluntarily withdrawn. So we did not have an FCC opinion on whether or not that would be a pre-recorded voice or artificial voice for purposes of the TCPA. Avatar technology, I understand, is very similar. And I think, you know, having not had the FCC really address it, there's still a question on whether or not the avatar technology will be considered to be pre-recorded voices or artificial voices for purposes of the TCPA. So I think there's still sort of an open question on the TCPA side on how that might be considered. So I think that helps clarify, because I've heard that term before, and I never really quite understood um, how that would be looked at. Um, what about the... And, and just to clarify, Ryan, you know, I've seen, you know, this has come across my desk several times now. You know, I believe Avatar is, is relying primarily on the, the letter from the FTC on call assistance technology. So, you know, that's sort of what they're relying on to talk about whether or not their technology will be considered a pre-recorded voice. Ryan, this is David Kaminsky. I'm going to have to go in a second, but someone asked a quick question about preview dialing. Preview dialing where an account pops up on a, um, on a uh, let's say, a, on a customer service rep screen, and then they have to press, quote, click, or they preview the number, and they have to press click in order to launch that call. Many companies were using preview dialing through their conventional dialers, thinking that, quote, that would be the um, enough of a human intervention um, to, um, let's say, pass muster under the uh, TCPA so that you weren't using a dialer because you had sufficient uh, human intervention. Question is this, before the new rules just came out, this issue has been heavily litigated, and unfortunately, most courts throughout the country on ruling on the preview dialing using a, quote, conventional dialer, or not a dialer that had the capacity to dial without human intervention, most courts have ruled that that was not, um, quote, that, that that was not sufficient human intervention to take the case out of um, the ATDS, the automatic telephone dialing system realm. So the issue has to be looked at very carefully in the context of the new order. There was no free pass for preview dialing, and if you're using preview dialing through a conventional dialer that has the capacity to dial without human intervention, buyer beware. Um, thank you very much, everybody, and forgive me. This is David Kaminsky signing off, and uh, great to work with my co-presenters. Really honored, and thank you so much, Ryan Thurman. Thank you, David. And I'm we're a very quick answer on the political thing. There's nothing in the ruling that addresses political calls or, or, or creates any different regime that has already existed. And for whoever asked that question, if you go onto the FCC's website, um, they have a lot of guidance and uh, reminders to political callers about the rules that specifically apply there. But you basically, you know, the, if you're calling wireless numbers, you have to have consent. I think, I think we're it. all happy to answer any questions by email after this presentation, and I'm sure we'll have some other webinar to continue talking about all the questions that everyone has. Absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate everybody's insight today. I think we did a really good job at kind of covering the major areas and tackled at least the kind of some of the major questions um, that are out there. So I really appreciate everybody taking the time and. I know everybody's got uh, other calls and things that go on, but definitely reach out. I've got the contact information up for the different attorneys, uh, Eric, Christine, Tanya, and David. We'll also send these slides out via a link and a link to the recording, which will all be um, up on our website hopefully later today. So we'll access that information and uh, share it with your uh, compliance teams. And uh, definitely look for additional webinars, compliance summits, and um, never hurts to have a good compliance company uh, as a vendor and be able to tackle the, the TCP scrubbing, litigator scrubbing, make sure you're covering your bases and make sure it's your uh, separating your landlines from your cell phones and looking at your communication and your dialer strategies going forward. Um, it's clear that the professional litigant crowd is going to grow um, 
from where it is now, which is already a, a major headache for a lot of our clients, into uh, uh, even a worse type situation going forward. So, again, thank you everyone for your time, and uh, we're going to conclude today's webinar. I appreciate everyone participating. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thanks All for right, setting us up. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Bye. Appreciate it.